in that emergency room to uh, think about uh, what was really going on and what's going on with the, uh, the individual patient. Um, and uh, so many stories that, uh, that changed my mind and then really got me to thinking, what, what are we really doing? Who are we really? What makes us work? What makes us better? What makes us think? Uh, and uh, it's still an evolving process. And um, if I was to open uh, Webster's Dictionary today, you'd probably look and it says the definition of doctor is teacher. Oh my gosh. just so happened that my first degree was in teaching. So maybe I was predestined to be a doctor. So today, the topic of conversation is uh, how to begin preventing the number one killer of Americans, and that's cardiovascular disease. And it comes in many, many different forms. It not just, just doesn't mean heart attack or stroke. There are many other facets of, um, of uh, what could be a low blood supply and what you can do to help yourself and your family. Why? Your family is important to you. So, why do we do it? Something in each of our minds clicked at some time that said, you know, I think there's a better way. And I have nothing against medicine. In fact, I'm a big fan of emergent medicine because not only have I been a benefactor of it, um, you're talking about the best of the best. I mean, somebody comes in the door and they've got something going on. You've got to decide what's going on right then and right there. But when it comes to emergent medicine, that's where it stops. It just stops right there. What about, what about our chronic disease? What about our fibromyalgia? What about our cardiovascular disease? What about our war on drugs? And that's just a play on words. If you have a war against something, are you ever going to fix it? The answer truly is no. Um, from the words of Mother Teresa, they asked her to march against something. Uh, let's have a war on um, an anger. Let's have a war on this. And she said, no, 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 I, won't, I will never march against something to have a war on something because all you're doing is creating more war. How about we have love? And so something in my heart said, you know, I don't want to have a war on drugs. I don't want to have a war on cardiovascular disease. It, it's, it has to be a better way. There's a different thought process. And there are many avenues to get better. And uh, we're always taught that, you know, if, if we're genetically predispositioned, uh, my parents had this DNA and I have this DNA, so therefore I must have this problem. Really? As uh, the DNA Genome Project says that 90% uh, of our DNA is junk. Well, what was the point of it? Well, the other 90% means that there's a way for us to change this. There's a way for us to express different things. So maybe what we have from what my parents have is, uh, and uh, I learned from them. They bend over and tie their shoes a certain way, and I bend over and tie my shoes a certain way, and it causes something to distress in my body, and I have the same back pain that they have. Is it really genetics? It's probably something we've learned. So in health, uh, we know that the answer to one question, unfortunately, leads to two other questions. So we never can stop learning. And it's, uh, it, that's where the quest in, uh, continues. It, we will always continue learning. This thing will always change. Uh, I've not given the same presentation at the same time ever. I always have to change something because something comes up. <laughs> so why do people neglect themselves? And I'm glad you're here because, of course, you never said anything like this, like I'm too busy or I don't have the time or I can't afford it. And, of course, this is what men say. I feel fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. That's right. You do feel fine. But the reality is... Um, and I'll just skip down to number three here. Half of all cardiac patients, there's really no significant history of high cholesterol blood pressure. You do feel fine. So why do we have this process going on? And so the question about, well, you know, do you have enough money to make yourself uh, be healthy? Well, the question is, when you're wealthy, will you be healthy? Big question. And is health your number one asset? You know, it's my opinion that it is. If we don't have that, we really can't go to work. We really can't have, uh, we really can't be around our family. Something's limiting if we don't have health. And uh, if you're not, somewhat in agreement in the top three, uh, how, do you, how do you really feel fine about this? That's for you to decide, that's just for me to throw at you. So the big thing is pay now or pay later. That's just the way it is. It's your investment, it's your health. So in the past century, we know that more research has been spent on medical research than all other history combined. It's not because we have more money, it's just that we're putting money into it. And why? The fifth largest century in the United States is hospitals. Big business, you gotta keep them in business and they're gonna do research there as well. We do have the best doctor to patient ratio than any other country. Eight patients, one doctor. That's pretty good. We have the most researchers in the medical community than any other uh, nation in the world, and we spend the most money than any other nation. According to the World Health Organization, because we are number one in spending, where are we in health? Like in a scale of, like, say, number one would be you're number one in spending, but you're number one in health, like is the overall health of the population. Where do you think the United States stands? Does anybody have a guess? We got 20, we got 50, it's between the two of them. Right now it's 38. 
when I got out of high school about half of my lifetime ago, it was 31. So we're going backwards. We're spending more money, we have more doctors, we have more hospitals, and we're going backwards. Does that make sense? So that means that the current model for our consistent health care is not going in the right direction. So we have to do something else. So we have to think differently. Current trends. So even with these uh, normal uh, inventions and new methods, which actually do help uh, prevent heart attacks and stroke that continue to rise. Um, has anybody noticed the incidence of decrease of stroke or heart attack with the invention of statin drugs? None? Nobody? Hmm. That's because it hasn't. In fact, it even says on their website, if you really look through the whole websites, it'll say these haven't been shown to reduce the incidence of heart attack and stroke. However, they do reduce LDL or the bad cholesterol. I can't argue with that. It does happen. But what are you taking it for? You're taking it to reduce heart attack and stroke. So different, different mindset, different thinking. Think about what's really happening. It's the mechanisms that really goes into these processes, and that's what I'm going to throw at you today. So it is also possible that some medications cause a problem. We all know that. There are side effects. Um, we also know that some medications scar or etch the inside of the arteries, which allow you to age faster. For example, statin drugs, which is a cholesterol-lowering drug, it, it blocks that LDL, which is our bad cholesterol, but it helps this enzyme. It actually blocks it, the HMG-CoA reductase, which makes the CoQ10, which keeps your heart pumping strong, reduce. So it's kind of like a Robin Peter to pay Paul. You're taking this one product so you can reduce your cholesterol, but the problem is your cardiac output is decreased, so then you're taking years off the end of your life. Is it really worth it? It all depends. Depends what your quality versus quantity is. You want to live forever and feel like crap? Or do you want to feel okay and maybe not live as long? Well, and that, that's still, are you actually still going to feel okay? Because one of the side effects of statin drugs is rhabdomyolysis, meaning that your muscles start to break down, especially in the shoulders and hips. We see it all the time. Um, and I think it's not, I don't report any of this stuff to um, any, uh, to the AMA or anything like that. That's not my job, but I just see it all the time. And if somebody gets off of it and it gets better, which happens all the time, um, there's only, that's the only coincidence. And so it's, it's, it's just there. So uh, a lot of folks are told to take aspirin. Here's what aspirin does. It reduces intravascular inflammation, the inside of the arteries. It's reduced by in inflammation by blocking platelet aggregation. That means so if you cut yourself, you're going to bleed a little bit longer. It's called a prolonged bleeding time. It is also estimated in NSAIDs, aspirin, Tylenol, ibuprofen, Aleve, uh, have a responsible for about 20,000 U.S. deaths. The big thing is aspirin because just a little bit of aspirin causes intravascular inflammation. Uh, you have increased bleeding time. This is, means increased bleeding time in the gastrointestinal tract in the gut. So a lot of people are losing blood that they don't know about, and then they get tired. And then about 125,000 hospitalizations from GI bleeding and ulcerations. This is from normal use. This is what's on the bottle, the RDA, the recommended amount. This is getting stuff over the counter. So stuff that gets over the counter is responsible for 20,000 deaths. I mean, think about how much money was spent in 9-11 for, let's say, 4,000 deaths. Or Pearl Harbor for 4,000 deaths. And this one thing is killing 20,000 people every year. How come we are not attacking this one thing? I mean, I know that those two incidents are very horrible, horrific things, but if you add them both up, this is twice as much every single year, every year, every year. That seems to not make sense to me. It doesn't make any sense that one person should die, let alone 20,000. That's just too many. And then we know, as far as cardiovascular health goes, there are a few drugs that uh, individuals can be on. Vasodilators, loop diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide, that's what they call necessarily a water pill, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. These also block the HMG-CoA cycle. So maybe your blood pressure comes down, but it's the end result is that the cardiac output decreases because we're losing that uh, CoQ10. So in addition to just taking these uh, medications, there's something like B6, which helps for nervous, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, vitamin C, zinc, phosphorus, thiamine, folic acid, and B12 are also excreted as a side effect. When you put something in your body, the body has to, to metabolize it and something else is kicked out. That's just normal chemistry. Well, when we're talking about folic acid and B12 and we're talking about cardiovascular health, folic acid and B12 are responsible for what's called demethylizing the inside of the arteries. So anything that gets methylized allows plaque to come in. So if we can demethylize, it actually keeps the, the arteries healthy. So it's kind of a catch-22. You take these things to make your cardiovascular system better, but in reality, it does something on the back end that doesn't make it better. So we can run a blood pressure test, and okay, your blood pressure came down, but the end result is, are you losing years at the end of your life? You bet. 
unless you replace them. So since 1980, we know that diabetes has increased by 300%. 80 million Americans have it, 6 million don't even know they have it. Why? They're probably men and they haven't been tested. So it's the fastest growing disease in history. It's cost more than cancer and AIDS combined, and we're not really that worried about it. And if you have diabetes or high blood pressure fluctuating, we know that you have a two to four time more risk for cardiovascular disease. And uh, this is the big one. If you drink just one soda a day, you will increase your risk to get diabetes by 83%. This came from a Harvard study. Uh, how many people drink pop? Uh, if we go around, I don't, don't raise your hands. You just, you know the people that drink pop, and if you've had it, you know you have it. And then uh, the, who's the biggest population that is addicted to this stuff right now? Anybody know? Elderly, there we go, youth. Kids, do they drink more than one? Yeah, and then they'll say, they'll come in and say, I only drink one a day, but it's one of those one a day. Uh, it doesn't quite work like that. So since 1980, HMO costs have doubled, obesity rates have doubled, 66% uh, of Americans are considered overweight, and 30% of children are considered overweight. Now, this also goes by uh, body mass index. I mean, technically, I'm still obese because uh, it just drives me nuts. Uh, we actually go by body fat, but they go by body fat, height, weight. Um, so the, the numbers are skewed when it comes to this. This came from the World Health Organization. And um, I'll give you, a, this bottom number I believe is actually true. Because when we were in, or well, shoot, when I was in school, we did have the obese child in class and his parents were morbidly obese. It's just the way it was. Um, and that's, that's what he was predestined to. But if I go to a grade school now, there's a lot of children that are obese. Where's it coming from? It's what they're putting in their mouth. It's what they're doing. Oh, physical education. Is that important in school anymore? No, it's been taken out. It's not important. Well, shoot, what did you do when you came home? You know what I did to get a hold of my friend when I was a kid? I ran a quarter mile to his house, because that's the closest neighbor I had, and knocked on his door. And if he wasn't home, I ran home. Now we can go boop, 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 text. You there? No? Okay. You want to play online? Yeah, okay. There's not any of that exercise that's going on. It's a, it's, it's a change that I'm having to adapt to with my own children, but at the same time, I still kick him outside and say, go play. Mm -hmm. So we have a problem. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine. For the first time in history, this first generation of children are not predicted to live as long as the previous generation. It's the first time ever, and it's because of what's changing. So a couple <coughs> things to explain. Atherosclerosis, and 50% of the population has it. What that means is if you have an artery, it starts to get plaque inside of it. And then there's another thing called arterial sclerosis. This means the artery itself is losing its elasticity. This happens as we, as we age, it's a normal process. Atherosclerosis is not a normal process. It's a process that happens as we have some sort of intravascular inflammation that causes plaquing to be in, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So everybody knows about these things, but they don't do much, do much to uh, change their lifestyle. And we actually have something to offer that's simple and easy to comply with. Uh, and easy with your lifestyle too, they make you feel better. So there is a way, a simple way, to reactivate the healing process. And here's the, the, the basic truth, is if the TV and the refrigerator weren't far apart, some people would never get any form of exercise. <laughs> so silent killers, we call them strokes, heart attack, aneurysm, even cancer could be per, uh, part of it. So we've all heard of somebody that we knew that's had a, what's called a silent killer, which means they just dropped over dead and they had no idea of what's going on. 47% of these silent killers occur outside of the hospital, and uh, many of these silent killers have death as their initial symptom. A high percentage of heart attack sufferers have normal cholesterol and blood pressure. I've said that before, I'll say it again. Uh, so we don't necessarily pin our laurels on if you have high cholesterol, then you have cardiovascular risk, and if you have low cholesterol, you're free to go. It's not true. So too often you hear the story of somebody going in for a routine test, only to be administered, let's say, a stress test, and they failed it. And then they found that they were like 95% occluded. How in the world could they be walking around 95% occluded in the, the heart or maybe in the carotids? It's because the body adapts. We can have 90% of our kidneys gone and we can still be moving. You can have most of your liver gone and you're still okay. The body makes adaptations. I mean, that's my job as a doctor is to decrease the adaptations to get you back to normal function. And so that's how it can work. Yes, guess what? They felt fine, but they weren't. So that's why we run the test. So today, heart disease kills more than the next six um, diseases combined, so we should really be paying attention to it because that's what's really going to get you. We know that it's one in three deaths is heart disease, and one of the big things that uh, most women don't always hear 
is that you're twice as likely to die from heart disease and all the forms of cancer. So we have, um, and I'm not against uh, Susan Komen's breast cancer awareness, or um, when Gilda Radner had ovarian cancer and they've had a lot of uh, different uh, studies for that, but those seem to take precedence over twice as likely to die from heart disease. Why? I don't understand. It, I just don't get it. So that's why I'm here. So we know that cardiovascular deals, disease kills about half a million Americans a year. 16 million Americans are disabled or in pain because of cardiovascular disease, and I'll get to some more details on that. We know stroke gets about 160,000, and then uh, as far as big business goes, yeah, almost a million angioplasties a year, uh, 600,000 open heart surgeries. Anybody know what an uh, average open heart surgery runs? Bill Wise? It depends. Uh, around here, probably 80,000. Yeah, it's yeah. You know, in Kansas City, it's about one hundred ten thousand, and that's we're just talking over our surgery. We're not talking transplant or anything like that. We're just talking about going and doing a little bypass, maybe taking something out of your leg, um, get you go home in two or three days. We'll see what uh, Medicare pays on it. See you later. That's where it is. Uh, that's too many. That's too much. This and and, and you got to think of it. it. This is actually a ninety percent preventable thing. So we can get those down under 100,000. What it would happen to HMO or Medicare or Medicaid if we got these down? They'd shut them down. Uh, hopefully. I think everybody should be responsible for their own health. I mean, if you look at, let's say, China or Korea or Japan, you know how they pay their doctors? They pay them to keep them healthy. Mm -hmm. Paying like $100 a month, keep me healthy. If I get sick, I get to come in as many times as I want until I get better. Isn't that a different way to think of it? Yeah. What do we do? Let's wait until we're sick, and then we're going to charge the most amount of money we can until we get better. I think it's, I think it's backwards. So do you have heart disease? And it doesn't mean you have heart disease. What about, is your blood supply perfect? So somebody could walk in the door to my office and say, I've got migraines, I've got well, you know, a high blood pressure, I've got chronic pain, I've got sexual dysfunction, meaning no libido, man doesn't have libido or can't get an erection. That's my first indicator. They've got a blood supply problem. They've got a blood supply problem there, they've got a blood supply problem somewhere else. Most likely it's even in the heart. Uh, lack of energy is a big one. Cold extremities, depression, sometimes you don't get the blood to the brain, you're tired. Uh, decline in vision, arthritis. Um, those are all there. I guess if you didn't get the decline in vision the first time, you get the second time. That's the first time I saw that. Okay. <laughs> so, <coughs> we'll get that fixed. So, I have two eyes. <laughs> no, that's true. I'll put left and right in, that'll make it easy. So, Every three minutes, someone dies from a stroke, and they may have not had any prior symptoms. And again, 47% of all diseases happen, or those cardiovascular deaths that are outside of the hospital. And this is a, a cause of a long-term serious uh, disability. Again, rise in healthcare. So are you at risk? These are factors you probably have heard of many, many times. Diabetes, inactivity, obesity, smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Let's get to some new stuff. So, endothelium testing, what you need to know. Dr. Orton gave just a brief introduction to endothelial testing. How do we test the inside of your arteries? And why in the world are we testing them? You have to have a reason to test it. Well, we want to know if you can make this stuff called nitric oxide. And because the more nitric oxide your body makes, the more healthy the endothelium will be. And why would you want to have nitric oxide? Well, it's part of the, the cardiovascular system, and it is the principal key to longevity. It's not to be used for everyone or for every delivery system. For instance, uh, if you took nitric oxide right now and just breathed it in, what would happen to you? <laughs> Might get a little loopy. But inside the cardiovascular system, it does something completely different. Um, sort of the same as hydrogen peroxide. If we take hydrogen peroxide and put it onto a wound, it'll start cleaning up and a bubble look kind of nasty. But if we took the same hydrogen peroxide, let's say it's uh, 30 molar, and we put it in our mouth, what's going to happen? It's going to start burning everything, and acid and base is not a good thing to have. So different processes, different, different parts of the body. In 1998, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Dr. Ignaro for discovering this nitric oxide in the cardiovascular system. It had already been discovered. I mean, Dennis had been using it for a while. But how it communicates along the cells of the cardiovascular system, how it actually makes us stay youthful inside. So outside the uh, arteries, nitric oxide is an environmental pollutant, but within the artery wall, it's produced at a controlled level, and it's an endogenous protector of the vessel walls. This is what is not necessarily a fountain of youth, but it keeps us from aging inside. Um, and so we talk a little bit about cholesterol. I have to get on my little soapbox about cholesterol, and this is what this is where it really got me thinking when I used to work um, in uh, pathology. Let's say we had somebody that came in that was. Um, 
the morbidly obese, and we draw blood on them, and it looked like a milkshake. And so we'd run their, their cholesterol, their triglycerides would be through the roof. But their HDL would be 87, and I'll give you a normal range. 30 to 60 is considered good. Above that, apparently, is considered great. So this person, I mean, this happened time after time again, 87, 87, 90. And uh, I went out and ran these marathons at one time in my life. I'll never run one again, so you don't have to ask me. Um, but my cholesterol, my HDL never got above 40. So what are these people doing differently than me? Well, let's look at the real thing, cholesterol. In cholesterol, we have three, two, side, two, there's actually lots of forms of cholesterol. But you know about the good stuff, HDL, and you know about the bad stuff, LDL. Guess what? There's three types of each. And so of the HDL, there's two good and one bad. Guess what fraction of these people had, they had all bad of the good stuff. And then on the LDL, there's two bad and one good. The good has to be in every single cell in your body or you disintegrate. You cease to exist. That's what's happening with the statin drugs is it's taking the good part away. Also, it takes away brain function. LDL, that good stuff, has to be in every part of your brain. That's what we're made of is fat. You have a fat brain, whether you knew it or not. You do. But if you're taking something that's taking it away, guess what happens to your memory? Can't remember what can't remember what I was doing today. So, anyway, LDL doesn't. It's, it, I just don't put it as a bad thing. Uh, it's a good thing because what if you have some sort of etching or scratching inside your arteries? The LDL comes down and puts a hole over it. It's your band-aid, and now it may become oxidized and become a plaque. That's totally different. Still another way you can fix it. And of course, free radicals. Uh, you know. There are different things that people can do that can change the, the pH in their body. And then they get what's called fatty deposits or foam cells and then these plaques. But guess what? That's a normal response. So should we attack this LDL and go after that, even though it's not a cause? I should be hearing no's. <laughs> we should go after what caused it. And when we get after what caused something, then we have a way to fix it. So nitric oxide works on that endothelium. Here's what it really does. It assists in the reduction of a plaque. That's good. So it increases the flexibility of the arteries. That means that arterial sclerosis is starting to decrease. That means our aging, normal aging process gets decreased. It smooths the walls of the cardiovascular system, which is because it's reduction, re reduction of the plaque. And here's the big kicker. There are 26,000 classified diseases. Um, I would say there's really probably eight to 10,000, but everything has kind of a crossover. And every single disease, every single disease, has a vascular component, an inflammatory component, and a vascular component. And so guess what? If you have a blood supply that's now being compromised because of a disease process and you have something that can reverse and increase the blood supply, guess what can happen to virtually every disease? They can get better. Will they all get better and will they all be disease free? No, but you can enhance their recoverability and increase the ability of the, the body to heal. So. Again, these are the circulatory problems. So if somebody comes in, I'm not necessarily looking for a heart attack on their way, but here's what happens. So let's say you have too high of blood sugar at certain times. Let's say you have too much stress in your life because it creates cortisol, which changes blood sugar. Let's say you take a medication that causes intravascular inflammation. Let's say you have, um, you take a digestive aid like Prilosec that changes your pH and doesn't allow you to absorb your B12 and folic acid. So something comes in here and etches the inside of this artery. Well, what comes along is LDL. And it comes in here and plugs the hole. Then it becomes a plaque. Well, over the course of time, this plaque can erupt, and this eruption here might be what's called an emboli, and that's how you get to a heart attack or stroke. That's how it happens. But it's not, you know, this is a disease. Migraines are a disease. Well, what's the cause? That's a blood supply problem. You have an artery that's shutting down, that's why you get a migraine. Whether it's from an allergy, or from a, a vascular problem, it's a blood supply problem. Same with high blood pressure. Is it really high blood pressure? Is the heart having to work harder because you have bad kidney function or bad extremity function? Or is it really the heart is just messed up somehow or there's something that's miscommunicating from the brain that's saying, work harder? Don't know until you have a real good exam, but if you give a medication that puts inside there, it's really not getting to that cause of the problem. It may make your blood pressure come down, but if you take that away, what happens to your blood pressure? comes right back up. So you're really addressing the cause. I don't think so. So many Americans don't make nitric oxide because of our lifestyles. We have blood sugar problems. We have blood pressure problems. We don't get out and move enough. We don't get out and make our own food. And then here's the big kicker. This is what got me interested in this in the first place. Too much exercise or too little exercise. Too much exercise, you know what that causes? Lactic acid. What was that? Lactic acid. 
lactic acid, well, acid is a part of it, but what we did, and I'm just saying we because I was in this group, my buddies, my semi-professional athletes and the professional athletes that still run today, when I run their tests on them, guess what happened? Well, guess what our arteries look like? You think that, let's say we're supposed to run 120 miles a week and we work out on a bike 300 miles a week. What, what are arteries supposed to look like? It's supposed to be flexible, strong, big, you know? Yeah. Uh, if you run my, like an EKG on me, my, this part of my part goes off the chart because it's so big because of my days of being an athlete. But my arteries look like junk. Why? We worked out so hard, we created free radicals. The free radicals are the inside of our arteries, just as if I was doing nothing, eating hamburgers, hot dogs, and all the great, great stuff that I like to eat, but I have to limit because I hear teaching you guys this stuff. <laughs> um, but we have the same problems. So I looked at, when does the average professional distance runner, triathlete, swimmer, uh, whatnot, an endurance athlete, when do, they, when do they typically die? In their 70s. Why? because they have too much exercise. The same process happens, just a different way. So we have to do the same thing about it. Also, what can create not enough nitric oxide is too much stress in your life. So we gotta learn how to, I'm not saying chill out, you just have to change your mind that things don't uh, occur the same way. And then of course, medications and infections. I mean, we had a guy that came in, he had a staph infection that got into his shoulder, lots of stuff. Well, that staph actually caused intravascular inflammation, the same process, and his numbers were through the chart. And we ran a, what's called a C-reactive protein on him. And it took us a while to get him back down to where his arteries were still up, back to being healthy again. So that can happen. So, who came up with all this stuff? <coughs> Tell you a little story about the, Dr. Prendergast. Um, at the age of 37, he decided, because his father had died of a cardiovascular uh, event, that he would run an um, abdominal scan. And what he found is he was just full of plaque. Everywhere, plaque, 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 plaque. And uh, at 37, you don't want to find out that you're pretty much terminal. And he decided he wanted to do something about it. And uh, I'll give you some background about him. He did figure out how to do something about it. And in fact, he was awarded uh, the American Diabetes Association Father of the Year. Now, he's an endocrinologist. He's not a cardiovascular um, or, or cardiologist of any means. But for him to get Father of the Year from the American Diabetic Association, being an endocrinologist kind of outside his field, uh, that's kind of big. So he's clinically tested more than 7,000 of his own patients. And by the way, when you start treating uh, diabetes patients, you really are going to have a bunch of patients that are going to get to go to the hospital for one reason or another, whether it's their blood sugar is off. Uh, but what's, what's on the death certificate of a diabetic? What do they die of? Diabetes is not up there. What do they die of? It's either heart attack or stroke. It's the cause of death. It's not diabetes. So here's one thing that he's got going for him. He hasn't lost one patient to heart attack or stroke in 19 years. Kind of big. So back to him. So after implementing his protocol, he uses this thing called LRG, and I'll get into it in just a little bit. His patients noticed the big nothing, meaning that when they took it, they didn't go, I feel great, I'm going to go run a marathon tomorrow. Um, but what they did notice is they didn't come in with the list. My head hurts, my foot hurts, my back hurts, everything hurts. I uh, can't seem to get my numbers to come down. He uh, slowly noticed that they were beginning to reverse the disease process didn't have to send him to the hospital. And after three months of implementing, uh, just putting somebody on it for about 90 days, he noticed that he no longer required that patient hospital staff uh, transition, meaning that he had to go do a lot of those rounds. So he was on that, he was on the correct path. Had to find out if he was on the correct path. So this uh, Dr. Williams from um, Europe, he's actually in uh, England, uh, started conducting his own clinical trials in the same process. Uh, the Lancaster School of Medicine is kind of like our Harvard School of Medicine, it's a tier one, um, medical school and also he's the head at one point of the British Heart Foundation now which would be considered like our American Heart Association. So pretty big up in the world and uh, pretty much collaborated and said yeah what you're finding is what we, we agree to. So January 2000 so after a decade of seeing his patients approved with LRG he decided he was going to do a follow-up scan and he was shocked to reveal that he had zero plaque in his cardiovascular system. This is the first time that somebody's actually been able to reverse <coughs> this process. And it was just by taking an arginine. It's just a, an amino acid. So in 1999-2000, uh, they began formulating this product called ProArginine and uh, started documenting the science of what is in this to be able to provide it to the general public. So what in the heck is L-arginine? Well, L-arginine makes that really important molecule called nitric oxide, which again is the master signal of the cardiovascular system. And then nitric oxide can reduce those platelets from sticking. That's your aspirin, by the way, for those who take aspirin. 
and improves the blood flow. It keeps that LDL from adhering to the, the vascular walls, meaning it, it shouldn't have a reason to have any etching in there because it's smooth in the wall, so the LDL doesn't have to sit up there. The LDL doesn't have to create a plaque. That's how it works. And then what else is in this product? Well, they put out citrulline in it, which is from watermelon. And that's important. It's another amino acid. It's important to keep the L-arginine firing and make it up to uh, 36 hours. If you just took L-arginine, and you can go to the, any health food store and get L-arginine, if you took, just took L-arginine, you're going to have to take it every four hours. So we want the compliance to be reasonable. We want you to be able to take something and have it work for you for a day. I wouldn't want you to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and then at 6 o'clock in the morning just to take your L-arginine so that your cardiovascular health is, is well. It doesn't make any sense. So L-citrulline isn't present in many formulas, and that's the key to what makes pro-arginine and what the research and science have shown and what makes it work so well. So now what? You've gotten some information, and um, can you pass it along? Think of anybody that might uh, want to know about this or even hear us speak. Uh, would you consider with the standard testing, or perhaps we should be looking at a different test? Um, you know, I say let's move forward. <coughs> let's move forward. We've got a couple other things to go over here first. So, if you were paying attention, we've got six people on here. Who's at risk? <coughs> I heard some people say the right answer. All of them. All of them. This creates cortisol. Uh, I got on my soapbox about cholesterol, but most likely they have high cholesterol because they're doing other things. Uh, high blood pressure could be stress, could be something else. Um, diabetes, of course. Postmenopausal. What in the world would make, besides other things, what would make you think that she might have a cardiovascular problem? Yeah. What is it? Estrogen. It's estrogen. It's estrogen, but it's not being broken down right. It has to do with the liver. But if it gets in the wrong process, guess what that does? It detches the inside of the arteries. So let's um, you know, pass this along because I want you guys to tell everybody about this that's on this. What's the longest time any woman should ever be on a birth control? The longest time before it starts to have negative effects on the cardiovascular system. Anybody know? What was that? Is it five to seven years? You're right. Five years. Five years. That's your that's your limitation. After five years, your incidence for cardiovascular stroke. I mean, have you seen all the, these ads that say, oh, by the way, you might have the uh, side effect might be heart attack stroke. Yeah. yeah. But go ahead and take it. Yeah. Side effects. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, that's why. It's because it creates this condition. So you know, a lot of young women are taking birth control, and I. I I mean, even if their period is incorrect, a lot of these physicians are putting them on birth control instead of addressing the process. Well, what are you doing? You're setting them up for failure down the road. It's not fair, and they don't know it. And I have asked today, I have documented about 480 young women that have been put on birth control, and I ask them, do you know how many years you can be on this before it causes a cardiovascular event? Not one of them has been told. Not one. So it's not being told. So I let them know, and then they can decide what to do with themselves. So... Let's see here. So some research, some real study, some real research it came from the High Desert Heart Institute. So High Desert Heart Institute is where doctors send their patients when they have nothing else to do with them. They can't do anything for them. And the patients that were selected for this study using proarginine were the 33 patients that were at high risk. They means they were at maximum medical care. They're on maximum beta blockers, maximum medical blockers, maximum Lasix, maximum oxygen. They didn't have anything else to do for these patients. And most of these had pulmonary primary pulmonary, primary pulmonary, hy uh, I'm sorry, hypertension, which means that they were on a transplant list. You got to get new lungs when you get that. And so the mortality rate, once they get diagnosed, is about two and a half to three years. Um, and uh, these patients are given Cialis, Viagra. By the way, what does Cialis and Viagra do? What does it create? Nitric oxide. Nitric oxide. Nitric oxide does what? Opens up the blood supply. That's how it works. And they're also given about 20 plus nitroglycerin tablets a day. That's a lot of nitroglycerin. In fact, uh, funny story about nitroglycerin, I just happened to have a nitroglycerin pill on my bag and I missed my flight uh, last week because they found nitroglycerin in my uh, check bag and thought I was, had a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a fun day for me. That was a great Christmas. Anyway, uh, the study continued. <laughs> now, these patients uh, also had other diseases other than uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. They had uh, just 
uh, peripheral artery disease, diabetes, chronic congestive heart failure, malignant hypertension, and high cholesterol. And these ages were 42 to 90 with a mean of 61. So the doctor who was in charge of this is Dr. Siva, he's the head of the High Desert Heart Institute. He's also a chief investigator for Pacemaker. Uh, and he's quadruple uh, board certified. So they, they test to make sure that you know, if somebody has a, a, a neurological problem and he's gonna put the pacemaker in. He's the one that tries to make sure that the, the new patents and everything are gonna work and how long it's gonna work. So the patients in this study, in his opinion, had no medical options left, nothing that they could do for him. So he didn't see a problem with them trying to do something. So he also wanted to uh, make a, a note that not a single medical procedure that he has had or even medication has decreased his procedure rate. They keep coming in. It's only affected the quality of life, so maybe it, it makes them feel better. You know, if you have congestion in your heart and you can give them medication that takes congestion of the heart, it's going to give you less pain. So it's going to increase the quality of life, but it really hasn't stopped the process. And uh, he, he talked about uh, in detail, a stent is really not, not a process either. It's just helping open up the area. And by the way, what are stents lined with? So that they don't get blacked up. They actually are lined with the arginine so that they can keep creating nitric oxide to keep that open. Um, and so, as he talked about it, L-arginine delays the process. So if somebody has one of these processes already occurring or, um, you know, they haven't been diagnosed yet, this L-arginine, which creates nitric oxide, does delay the process. There's those other intangibles. Are you going to get out and move? Are you going to stop putting things in your mouth? Are you going to possibly, if you're a diabetic, are you going to be in, be in control of that? <laughs> if you're not, you're still going to have the same outcome, but maybe you're going to get an extra 10 or 15 years. So. Uh, that's why he believes in, uh, there's a benefit to something that creates nitric oxide, like the pro-arginine, and why the Nobel Prize was awarded. So in his clinical trial, they had their patients uh, take pro-arginine for 90 days, and they ran about 7,400 tests, and you know they ran echo tests, see how the heart function was, uh, bone scans, and of course tons of laboratory tests. And so here are some results. They had an 18% increase in HDL, that's our good cholesterol. 40% decrease in triglycerides. The glucose and A1C, A1C is how we monitor if uh, somebody is actually uh, taking their insulin or they have a long-term blood sugar thing. It actually dropped 25%. I loved, uh, there's a couple different lab tests you can run and you can catch people that are cheating. A1C is one of those because uh, I could, let's say we have a diabetic that doesn't want to take their insulin or is non-compliant. They don't take, they don't take, they don't take, and then they take it the day they come in and we run their blood test. Well, their glucose is fine, but their A1C is going to be through the chart. I got you. Um, there's, a, there's a few tests that we do like that. So anyway, it dropped the A1C. Well, that tells us over, um, the A1C is supposed to be what blood sugars look like over the last 180 days, but in reality, it's, it's catching it at 90 days, so that's a good thing. The creatinine decrease, that means the, the pressure off the kidneys, the swelling in the kidneys, the disease in the kidneys is starting to break down, or uh, getting better. Magnesium increased 35% without giving them magnesium. So anybody that's on Lasix, what it kicks out of the body is magnesium. Well, magnesium is only important for 3,500 enzymatic processes in the body, so it is important. So the fact that it increases, it means that it's helping many other things that are going on. The platelets decreased. Um, the microalbumin increased 70%. Again, that's kidney function. Vitamin D, which uh, is vitamin D a vitamin? No, no. Hey. We got it. So vitamin D is a hormone. Just was found at the time that they were classifying everything as a vitamin. <coughs> vitamin D works in so many different ways, and uh, vitamin D is a fat-soluble hormone. And there's um, um, a lot of research mm -hmm. that if you have enough vitamin D, you really should never get the flu. And if you have the flu, you can take X amount of vitamin D and um, be able to thwart it in 24 hours. And I've done that in my practice for the last five years, and we have really not had any issues with flu. But anyway, a lot of these patients with cardiovascular disease were 84% low. 84% of them on the baseline were deficient. Deficient is such a low number. Anyway, so they probably were all deficient, but they'd increased 180%. That's huge. And then, of course, the C-reactive protein, which tells us how much inflammation is inside the arteries, also decreased 80%. Another big thing. So from a blood pressure standpoint, the systolic or top number decreased by 13%, and the bottom number decreased by 17%. This is actually significant. And I'll tell you why. I can jump on you, scare from you from behind, uh, come at you with a white coat, scare you with a needle, whatever needs to happen. This number is going to go up quickly, get back down. This one really isn't. So uh, the contemporary thought is um, you need to treat uh, your patient for high blood pressure once the systolic number is over 140. Now, New England Journal of Medicine came out with some great studies that said you don't even touch a person until it gets over 100 on the bottom because that's the stable number. So the top number could be high, but until that diastolic really gets above 100, 
and in fact, that's how I re encourage my patients. You know, they got high blood pressure, this might happen. Unless they're driving a truck or something that requires a CDL license, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll take care of it a different way. The ankle brachial uh, index, which means you take blood pressure in the arm and then the leg, also decreased. That means the entire blood supply was getting out to the body. The Doppler block, block is decreased. That's taking a, a Doppler. And then, of course, their, uh, their stress test, that walking treadmill test that runs for six min minutes, these patients all improved. When they took them off of the progen at the end of 90 days, they began to have their pretrial numbers. Why? These people were grossly diseased. I don't see anybody in here that's in this category. So you're catching it way before you get there. Um, and some people have to be on this long term. And uh, my goal is that everybody can have something like this, be on it, and then be able to do lifestyle modifications that they can either come off it or they can get to a reasonable number like you have to take it once a week or every two days or something like that that, that makes it uh, either easy to comply but it's also uh, keeping you normal. So before you got in here, or before I got in here, Dr. Wharton handed out a test. It's just an endothelial test. It says it, it adds up your risk factors. And so this is what typically happens in our office when our person comes in for the very first visit, even if they rolled an ankle, they still have to fill this out. And I'll tell you why. One of my very first patients came in with an ACL tear. Um, about 10 years ago, and uh, was something that was a grade three strain could have been uh, surgical, but he didn't really want to have surgery, and we got it better in a fairly short amount of time, about four visits. And uh, about three months later, he had a heart attack. And I said, "Dang, never checked him for that. I only checked him for the knee that he came in. Just checked my knee. So now we do a lot of different tests. We look at everything that we can." so that we can give the, uh, the entire body a thorough uh, look. Now here's, here's what really shocked me. I can get somebody out of pain pretty quick, but what if I don't improve their cardiovascular health? Still a 50% chance they're gonna die. Something that I could have prevented or taught them about. So it hit me like a brick. Now here's the, 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 the kicker with this guy. They actually found that his cell phone was causing the heart abnormality that was causing, because he kept having it on it. He put his cell phone in his front pocket. When he took a cell phone off, the echo and everything else would show up, and the EKG would show up okay. But when he put a cell phone back on there, it went off the chart. So his cell phone was actually the cause of his heart attack. Of course, when I tested him, I don't allow anybody to have cell phones or anything on. Uh, that's uh, neither here nor there. But um, anyway, just a heads up. So how healthy are you? You may feel wonderful. Are you? I don't know. Uh, somebody could come crawling into my office, and they have one thing wrong, and somebody walks in and looks like a million dollars, and we run some tests and say, oh, boy we need to talk. So uh, what to do if you score high? Well, we do what's called a B-Pro or cardio pulse weight test. It tells us the uh, health of your arteries, the health of your heart. It's a class two medical device. It's non-invasive, it's painless, it takes about two minutes. It's 99.1 second, 99.17 percent as accurate as a femoral catheterization. What that is when they take a tube up your leg and take a look at your heart. It tells you everything within the heart. Well, what about the rest of your body? I want to know about the rest of your body. So it also gives you a physiological age of your heart and arteries, and one of them is called a CAS score. It tells us the heart, and one's called radio augmentation index. This is RAI. It tells us about the arteries. It doesn't differentiate between arterial sclerosis or atherosclerosis. It really doesn't matter. We know that those are just part of the aging. So we know where the messenger is, those life-changing information. But I want to show you. So that's a healthy artery. And then here's an artery with just a little bit of plaque. You can see the plaquing down here. And then if the artery goes into spasm, this is when we start to have what's called angina or pain in the chest or even pain in the legs. Uh, like say somebody flies or they're sitting, in, they're sitting in the car a lot, starts to that hole gets a lot smaller. And that's when that blood pressure really is going to have to come up. And so if somebody has a real cardiovascular issue, they'll get nitroglycerin. Of course, nitroglycerin goes in and blows this thing up. What does nitroglycerin create? Nitric oxide. So that's what nitric oxide does. So what does an arterial pulse form? And this would be like in a 25-year-old. So this heart contracts, it goes down the artery, and it expands. The body absorbs it, and it comes back. So this wave uh, is a lot lower than this peak here, so the reflected wave. It's sort of like throwing, a, let's say, a ping pong ball against a wall, but that wall has a drape and a blanket on it. Uh, so it really gets absorbed. So that's a 25-year-old. But what happens when we hear it about 47? Technically, we start to get into arterial sclerosis. And so we've taken away the, the uh, maybe the thick blanket or the quilt, and now we just have a little sheet on there. 
So it's, it's coming back, it's still less, but it's not as absorbed, and that would be hit, uh, of a 47 year old. And then as we become about 80, we've taken that sheet away, and that bowl's actually coming back faster now. So this is how our device measures what's going out and what's coming back, and can quantify what the AGR arteries are. This is what, um, you know, pretty much convinced me after three years of running the test. By the way, I was pretty skeptical about the first one. Um, and I had to do all my research to find out all the FDA approvals and everything before I uh, really bought into that my, my test never changed for three years because I didn't do anything. But um, once we find out what's going on, now we have a way to quantify, well, what do we need to do for you? So if you're eight years old and you show up as a 25-year-old, what do I have to do for you? Nothing. But if you're 25 and you show up as an 80-year-old, we need to get on top of this. I have a few quotes on here. Oh, man, I need to fix that. So the uh, first one was, what lies behind us and what lies before us, but tiny matters of what lies within us. And believe that your life is worth living and your belief will create that fact. That's from William James and from George Bernard Shaw, it's a sin to be poor. And then the last one from uh, Winston Churchill, we make a living by what we get and we make a life by what we give. So if you need any more information, this is uh, what I have, our phone numbers, my website, my email. And then if you want to learn more about the uh, ProArgene itself, you can get on this and uh, MiracleMolico.com has a lot of different uh, short videos that will tell you how it's created, what it's doing, a little bit more information than I've, I've thrown about it. Thank you. Thank you.